be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God has manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Good morning. It's really good to look out and see you all today, and we hope that you've come for no other purpose than to worship the God of heaven. We're grateful for your presence, and especially if you're visiting with us, we count you as our honored guests, and we hope that you'll return time and time again. We have a simple goal here, and that is to open up the scriptures, learn them, and do them. And we hope that that appeals to you, and we hope that that, that, that simple approach and that simple appeal brings you back again and again. We're always open to your questions and comments. Uh, if you should see something here or hear something uh, that you don't understand, let us know about that. We'd be happy to discuss that, and I'll take responsibility for the things that I say. And so if you don't understand something I say in the pulpit, you may ask me about that afterwards, and I'd be happy to discuss that with you. But we're glad you're here. Come back. Be with us tonight at 5. We have Bible study for all ages, and Wednesday nights at 7. We have Bible study for all ages then as well. And come back and see us anytime you have a chance. In 1 Timothy chapter 3... Uh, we read of a, a very fascinating passage which makes a sermon in and of itself. In fact, it will make the sermon for today. The outline for my sermon is in verse 16. And there the Apostle Paul says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. This text gives us, in capsule form, if I can use that expression, in capsule form, some basics of our faith. It is rich in meaning. There is a lot here in this simple verse. And it talks about how uh, Jesus manifested in his own life the mystery of godliness. Godliness there, in verse 16, uh, is simply piety or respect for God. Uh, the word does not mean godlikeness. There's a lot of people who misunderstand that. It does not mean godlikeness. But it means respect for God. It means reverence and piety. And uh, it links in with the previous two verses. And that's the reason I had verses 14 and 15 read. Because verses 14 and 15, Paul is telling us why he wrote the, the letter uh, to Timothy. And he says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Timothy, I'm writing this down. I hope to see you pretty soon, but I may not. And so if I'm delayed, verse 15, I write... So you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, the house of God is not the church building. A lot of people misunderstand that as well. And so he's not saying how to behave in the church building. That's not what he's writing about. That's not, that's not the point. The house of God is the family of God, uh, the people of God, or as he describes it there, the church of the living God. So the house of God, the family of God, the church of God. And what he's saying here is, I'm writing so you know how to behave yourself as a Christian. That's really what he's saying here. And so that was the reason this letter was written to Timothy. That's really the reason that all the New Testament was written, so we would know how to behave ourselves as Christians. And then he says, if you have any doubt about how to behave yourself, all you got to do is look to Jesus Christ. Because he reveals to us in his own life the mystery of godliness. You want to know what it means to respect God? You want to know what it means to follow God? Then you need look no farther than Jesus. Because he had the greatest respect for his Father in heaven. And he followed him even better than any of us could ever do. Because he followed the Father perfectly in every way. And so Jesus is the mystery of godliness. And so... We're just going to take verse 16 this morning and break it down and talk about uh, the various things that are said there. And the first thing that it tells us is that God was manifested in the flesh. That is clearly a reference to Jesus Christ. And uh, we read uh, uh, in the Gospels, for example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so God was manifested in the flesh. The Word, which was God, became flesh. That's an allusion there clearly to Jesus Christ. And so that's just an incredible thing. Uh, Brother Jeff was talking at the table this morning about how God loved us. And isn't that amazing? God loved us so much that He would put on human flesh, that He would take on uh, the constraints of human flesh. And that he would die for our sins. And the, the fascinating thing about this is that prior to his coming, God was not fully revealed. We knew things about God. Uh, the Old Testament scriptures had been revealed and there were some things revealed there about God. But we really didn't know him face to face, you might say. In John 1 and verse 18, uh, we were looking at verse 1. We looked at verse 14. And then in verse 18, he says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now he's talking about... Jesus, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. And he says, we haven't seen God. That is, I haven't put, laid my eyes on God. But he said, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen Him. Because the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, that's an expression indicating that He has the closest of relationship, the closest of affinity, the closest of fellowship with His Father. And He has declared Him. And so Jesus came to declare to us what God is all about, what God likes, what God dislikes, what God expects, uh, uh, what God feels and how He feels toward us. All of that is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Moving in your Bibles on out to John chapter 14. Jesus was, was preparing to go to the cross and He was preparing His disciples for that blow that it would be to their faith because they'd been with Him for three years now and uh, pretty soon He was going to be taken from them in a, in a rather violent way. And he was going to be nailed to a cross and put to death. And Jesus is kind of preparing them for that. In verse 7, he says something interesting to his disciples. He said, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip, who's one of the apostles, he said, Lord, show us the Father. And it's sufficient. But we want to see God. Show him to us. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long and yet you've not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe for the sake of the works themselves. So Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. You want to know anything about God? Look to Jesus. You need to look no further than that. To know Jesus is to know God. That's what he's saying. That's how close their relationship was. And so there's no uh, separation in terms of their nature, in terms of their desires, in terms of their expectations. They are the same. And so it's just an amazing thing to think that God loved us that much. And he came here, manifest himself in the flesh for for a mission. He came on a specific mission. He came to die for my sins. And in the process of living and dying, he also left for me an example. And that's why Paul says, right here is the mystery of godliness. You look to his example. You look to the Son of God. You look to the one who was manifest in the flesh. He'll show you what it's all about. He'll show you what it means to, to be godly, to respect God, to have reverence for God. And so that is an amazing truth there in and of itself. But he goes on to say, that he was justified in the Spirit. The word justified uh, literally means to show to be right. You know, a lot of people come along and have come along over the years saying, I'm God. Uh, and, and they claim deity. And so, you know, it, it seems like it's appropriate to ask such a person for their credentials. What is your proof? You say that you're God. You claim that you're God. That's a mighty incredible story. What is your proof? How do you prove yourself to be right? And he says he was justified in the Spirit. And if you'll notice your translations capitalize Spirit, which indicates that the translators believe, and I think correctly so in this case, that the Spirit here was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit went with Jesus all through His earthly life. And the purpose of that was that he might work those miracles. And those things justified or showed him to be exactly who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God in the flesh, but he was justified or shown that that was the truth by the work of the Spirit. For example, you think about the baptism of Jesus. It hadn't been that long ago. We've been studying on Wednesday nights in the Gospel of Matthew. And just a few weeks ago, we were talking about the baptism of Jesus. And John the Baptist uh, says in John chapter 1, that, that I was told, the person who sent me to baptize told me that upon whom I see the Spirit of God descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And John says, I have seen and I testify or bear witness that this 
is the Son of God. John the Baptist leaves his testimony for us. He said, I saw this. I saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a, like a dove. I saw the Spirit of God remaining upon him. That's in John chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. And I saw that, and I'm testifying to you, I'm bearing witness to you that he is the Son of God. Jesus himself said in Matthew 12, verse 28, he uh, had cast a demon out of somebody, and he was accused of being possessed by the devil. They said, well, he, this man does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And Jesus went on to respond to that charge. And in that response in Matthew 12, 28, he says, If I, by the Spirit of God, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, the rule or the reign of God has been manifested in that very act. And so the Spirit of God uh, working with Jesus in the casting out of those demons. Even at his resurrection, in Romans 1 and verse 4, Paul says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. And again, the word spirit there is capitalized, indicating that the translators believe this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, according to the spirit of holiness, he says. And so, oh, and by, and finishing the verse, by the resurrection from the dead. And so the spirit raised Jesus. And in all of these things, at his baptism, when the spirit descended upon Jesus, in his miracles, as he cast out demons and did other signs and wonders by the spirit, at his resurrection, being raised by the spirit of God, these proved and justified and showed Prove that Jesus' claim was right. He is indeed God manifested in the flesh. There's plenty of evidence for that. People today doubt those claims. But you go back and you look at the claims and, and understand, folks, that the claims that we have written here are written by the people who were there. Written by the eyewitnesses who saw Jesus, who heard Jesus, who ate with Jesus, who witnessed His death, who witnessed His resurrection. They gave their life for that testimony. This is not just something that someone sat in a little room and dreamed up and made up. This is eyewitness historical accounts with the testimony backed up by the Spirit of God. And so God was manifested in the flesh and He was justified in the Spirit. And then we move on out into the text and it says He was seen by angels. Now that's an interesting expression. And I've often wondered in my mind and kind of bandied back and forth in my mind exactly what that means. And there's really two possibilities here. The word angel uh, in the Greek language simply means a messenger. And if you do a little study on that word, sometimes it's used with respect to earthly messengers. Uh, John the Baptist is described as an angel. Behold my messenger who goes before me. Uh, and that's a quote from the Old Testament. And that, the word translated messenger there is the Greek word for angel. And so there are earthly messengers. God uses earthly messengers. And then there are those heavenly angels. And I think the text could go either way. Let me show you why that's true. First of all, the earthly messengers. He was seen by the apostles. You see, there had to be witness. I was just telling you about the eyewitness testimony about the men who were there who saw him and heard him and witnessed his death and witnessed his burial and witnessed his resurrection. These were the messengers that were sent out. That's what the word apostle means, by the way. It also means messenger, literally one sent out or one sent forth. And so the apostles were the messengers or the angels who were witnesses of his resurrection. That's one possibility. Take your Bibles, if you doubt me on this, and turn to Acts 1 and in verse 8. Jesus here is promising the Holy Spirit to His apostles. And He says in Acts 1 and verse 8, But you, and that's not you and me, that's the apostles He's talking to in the context there, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That incidentally is an outline of how the book of Acts unfolds. Acts 1.8 is the outline for how the entire book unfolds. But he says, you're going to be witnesses. You're going to be messengers. You have seen me. You've seen my life. You've seen my miracles. You've seen my death. You've seen my burial. You've seen my resurrection. And now I'm sending you out as messengers into the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's one possibility. The second possibility, of course, is those heavenly angels. And that's also true. Both ideas are true. And so I don't know that there's any conflict, and I don't know that we even have to decide whether it's this earthly angels or heavenly angels, but certainly he was, heavenly angels were all involved in his life. When he was born, in Luke chapter 2, there was an angel of the Lord that appeared and said, I bring to you this day glad tidings of good things. For unto you there is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Tis Christ the Lord. He went on to say, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling claws. And so there was an angel who announced his birth. 
And it goes on there in Luke chapter 2, and it says, uh, Immediately there was with him a, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And so at his very birth, there were angels present. He was seen by angels. Angels witnessed his glorious birth. And then later, uh, some 30 years later, when Jesus was baptized, he was sent out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we read about three temptations there in Matthew chapter 4. Now we know from other scriptures that that was not the only time Jesus was tempted. But we read about those three temptations in Matthew chapter 4. And at the end of that, it says in Matthew 4.11 that angels came and ministered to him. And so they were present at his birth. And they were present after his temptation there. And the angels came and ministered to him. And then when Jesus, three years after that, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was deeply troubled. He knew what was coming. And he knew that men were going to be mistreating him and falsely accusing him, that they would scourge him, that they would mock him, that they would nail him to a cross, and he would hang on that cross until he died. And from a human perspective, that's a little bit troubling, isn't it? Who would, who would want to go through that from a human perspective? Who wants to have nails driven in their hands? Who wants to be scourged? Who wants to be mocked? Who wants to be falsely accused? Who wants to be put to death? And so he's praying in the garden. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And in Luke 21, verses 41 to 43, it says there was an angel that came and strengthened him. And so once again, in the Garden of Gethsemane, angels saw the Lord. They saw his birth. Uh, They saw him there in the garden. They saw him after his temptation. And then at his resurrection... In Matthew 28 and also in Luke 24, there were at least three angels involved. Because in Matthew's account, it tells us that the stone was rolled away and there was an angel sitting on top of the stone. Those stones that they used to roll in front of those tombs, the tombs were basically caves. And they would roll a huge stone. Those are huge. You're not going to move that by yourself. And so that stone is rolled out of the way and sitting on top of that stone was an angel, according to Matthew's account. And then when they go inside, at the head and at the foot of where the body of Jesus formerly lay. It's no longer there because he's been resurrected. There are two more angels. And so two, possibly three angels present as his resurrection. So he was seen by angels. And I think that that could encompass both the earthly messengers and the heavenly. He was seen by those apostles who bore witness of his life, his death, burial, and resurrection. He was seen by heavenly angels at his birth and at his temptation and at his, in the garden of Gethsemane and at his resurrection. He was attended to and seen by angels. And so what a remarkable life. We can't testify to that about ourselves, can we? We, can't, we don't know whether, there, whether there's been any angels involved in our lives or not, but we know they were involved in the life of the Son of God. And so he has plenty of evidence and testimony and witnesses to bear witness to his identity. The Bible tells us also that he was preached among the Gentiles. The King James Version and the New King James uses the word Gentiles. Uh, most other translations uh, use the word nations, and there's a reason for that. The Greek word that's translated, eth- or gen- translated Gentile there is the word ethnos. You may recognize that word. We talk about ethnic in our culture today. And the word ethnos means any nation or people. And so it's, it, this really, I don't think, is restricted to the Gentiles. It's talking about all nations. But just let me show you some passages where the word ethnos is used so you can get a, a feel for the way this word is used in Scripture. In Luke chapter 7, the word ethnos, and that's the same word that's being used in this verse right here where it says preached among the Gentiles. In Luke 7 and verse 5, It says here, for he loves our nation, for he has built us a synagogue. Now you can see clearly from the context there, he has built us a synagogue. These are Jews. But he loves our nation, our ethnos. And so there the word nation or the word translated Gentiles is used to describe the Jews, the Jewish people. And that is the same exact word that's being used right here. We move on out to chapter 23. And again, the word ethnos is used to describe the Jewish nation. Luke chapter 23 and verse 2. And this is at the trial of Jesus. It says, They began to accuse Him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that He Himself is Christ, a King. And there He's perverting the Jewish nation. 
In fact, some translations will say perverting our nation. These were Jews leveling these accusations against him. And there the word ethnos, the word that's translated Gentiles in our Bible, the word that's translated Gentile here, clearly referring to the Jewish people. But then we move into other passages where the same word is used, and clearly there's a distinction being made. In Romans chapter 3, for example, just follow this with me. I'm just wanting you to get a, a flavor for how the word is used in Scripture. In Romans 3 and verse 29, it says, Is he a God of the Jews only? So there's the Jewish people. Is he also not a God of the Gentiles? There's ethnos, the same Greek word. It was used to refer to the Jewish nation in Luke chapter 7 and in Luke chapter 23. Here is being referred to those who are not Jews, to the Gentiles. Yes, he's a God of the Gentiles only. And so we begin to see the generic nature of this word. And so I would suggest to you that priest among the Gentiles is probably too narrow of a translation here. It should say preached among the nations, and you'll find that in the NIV. You'll find that in the New American Standard Version. You'll find that in the English Standard Version, and probably most other modern speech translations will render that nations. Now let me tie that to Jesus Christ here real quickly. In John chapter 11, this is a fascinating text in and of itself. The high priest, who was actually an enemy of the Lord, is forced to prophesy about the Lord. I I find that fascinating. In John chapter 11, in verse 47, the the chief priests, the Jewish leaders are getting together and they're they're bellyaching about Jesus. They don't like him. You've got to get rid of this guy. And so in John 11, verse 47, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and they said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? Notice they're not denying the fact that he's working miracles. Uh, What are we going to do about it? We don't like the fact that he's working miracles. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You see, even at this stage in the game, they knew this that at some point they were going to have conflict with the Roman Empire. And it came some 40 years later. But they knew even at this stage in the game that conflict was coming. And the Romans will come and they will take away our place in our nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said, You know nothing at all, verse 50, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Ethnos. He's talking about the Jewish nation. And one man should die for the, for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Verse 51, a little commentary by John. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Now catch it, watch it, him expand it now. And not for that nation only, that is not for the Jewish nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad, the Gentiles. And so... You see how that word ethnos is used there. And I think in this passage it, it should, be, should be translated nations. Not simply Gentiles. Not restricted to the Gentiles. Not limited to the Gentiles. Because he was preached among the world. He was preached among the Jews and the Gentiles. And that's why Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, Go therefore and teach all nations. Not just the Jewish nation. Go therefore and teach all nations. In Mark's account in Mark 16 and verse 15. Go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature, not just to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews. On the day of Pentecost, when that commission is being fulfilled or being carried out by his apostles, Peter said in Acts 2.39, For the promise is to you, the Jews, to your children, your descendants, and to all who are afar off, the Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so preached among the nations, all the nations. And the fascinating thing to me about this Notice the past tense, preached among the nations. This was carried out in the first century. This is fascinating. Turn, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. Now, that doesn't mean there's no preaching to do today because there are people been born since then. But this commission was carried out in the first century without the Internet, without radio, without television, without mass marketing, Without copy machines, without books, it was carried out by word of mouth as these men went and preached. In Colossians 1, this is written about A.D. 62. And in Colossians 1 and verse 6, he says, he talks, let me give you a little context. Verse 5, he talks about the truth of the gospel, tail end of verse 5. Verse 6, which has come to you, that is, the gospel has come to you. Watch this now. As it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. 
as it is also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Notice that expression, all the world. Now drop down to verse 23. He says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached, get it now, to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, look at the language of verse 6, all the world. The language of verse 23, every creature. I don't think Paul used that language by accident because that's exactly the language in Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world, verse 6, and preach the gospel to every creature, verse 23. Paul is borrowing the language of the Lord himself from the gospel of Mark. He says we've done the very thing the Lord has told us to do. He's told us to go into all the world. The gospel has gone into all the world. He's told us to preach to every creature. We've preached it to every creature. We have done exactly what the Lord has told us to do. Preached among the nations. That's the story of Jesus. That's the story of the gospel. But then the reaction to the message. Believed on in the world. Now notice it doesn't say everybody believed it. The truth of the matter is most people disbelieve. Most people look at that and and, and say... Who cares? Sadly, a lot of people in the world, who cares about the Bible? Who cares about Jesus? Who cares about worshiping God? A a lot of people in the world take that approach. Other people take the skeptical approach, and they would say, you really think that he was God in the flesh? Do you really believe that? And and I do. I believe it with all of my heart. There's no doubt in my mind. Because the evidence has been examined and re-examined by me over the years. And I've looked at it. And every time I look at the evidence that's contained in the Bible, that's contained in the Gospels, I'm more and more impressed. My faith is more and more bolstered. And I'm more and more sure that, yes, He is the Son of God. He was God manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the Spirit. He was seen by angels. I have no doubt about these things. To me, these are historical facts just as surely as the, as the historical fact of George Washington's existence, as surely as the historical fact of Abraham Lincoln's existence, I believe in the historical fact that Jesus existed. I believe that He was indeed God in the flesh. But you know, the Bible tells us that faith, and that's what belief is, faith comes by hearing. And so you see here, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. Most people are going to say no. But there were some who believed it. And the reason they believed it was because they were persuaded by the infallible proofs that were offered. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. The book of Acts is the follow-up to the book of Luke, both written by the same individual. Obviously, Luke being the author of the book we identify by his name. And then Acts was the follow-up. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. And in Acts 1 verse 1, Luke says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. If you were to go back in the Gospel of Luke and look at the beginning, Luke is writing to this man named Theophilus. And so the writer here is saying, remember back to that first letter I wrote, that first account of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He said, now I'm going to finish the story. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them for 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of people would say, well, they just imagined they saw this. But that's why he talks about 40 days. This wasn't a one-time thing. I thought I saw Jesus a week ago. No, they saw him for 40 days. They talked with him for 40 days. He would say, Thomas, look here at the nail prints in my hand. Thomas, stick your hand right in there. And don't be unbelieving, but believe. And he would be with them and talk with them. And they could witness. This is the same. They could say, yeah, I saw him hanging on a cross. I saw him die. I saw them take him down. I saw them wrap him up. I saw them put him in the grave. And now he's alive. I saw all of this. And Jesus spent time with us for 40 days. These are infallible proofs. They're ungetoverable proofs. And those people were so convinced that they died one by one for that testimony. They didn't back up for a second. The only one who died a natural death, as far as we know, I'm talking about the apostles here, was John. And, and he's the only one of the apostles that we know of that died. And the rest of them were put to death. The rest of them were persecuted until the point that they died. And never once did they back up. I believe this. And because they were convinced, 
they were able to convince many people in the world as they went forth and preached him among the nations. And that shows the result. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That same message is going forth today. You're hearing it today. And you have an opportunity today to believe the same message that they believed. And the evidence isn't going to change. The evidence is there. That's what we're saying to you. And then finally it says he was received up in glory. This is, of course, a reference to his ascension, his ascension to heaven. Uh, In Mark, the 16th chapter, in verse 19, Jesus, uh, it says, after he had spoken to them, was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. The right hand is the favored position. And so he sits there at the favored position at the right hand of God. He sits there as King of kings and Lord of lords. In John 17, verses 4 and 5, Jesus was offering up his, his, as we've said many times, the longest recorded prayer of the Lord. It says in John 17, verse 4, he says, Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you've given me to do. Verse 5, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Here's the reason I quoted that verse. He talks about the glory. The glory that I had with you before the world was. And so Jesus, referring back to his original uh, place there in heaven at the right hand of the Father, he says, I need to go back there. I want to go back there. I'm asking you to take me back to that place. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, earlier we looked at verse 8 about the witnesses. In verse 9, It says, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their side. They they witnessed the Lord ascending back into heaven. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. There's some more angels that we were talking about earlier. Two men stood by them in white apparel. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? What are you looking at? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is coming back. He's, he was received up into glory and he's going to come back. Take your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 7. Here we see what happened when he was received up into glory. Daniel, through the Spirit of God, looking forward some 600 years into the future and seeing the ascension, the receiving up of Jesus into glory. This is when he came in to his glory. He came into his kingdom. In Daniel 7 and verse 13, Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. This is the ascension of Jesus. And he's coming to the Father. And what happens when Jesus goes back to heaven? Verse 14, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. When He sat down at the right hand of God, He began began His reign. He was anointed as King, and He began His reign as King. He was received up into glory. From there, He will come back to judge the world. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, Paul was trying to give some words of encouragement to these brethren. They were being persecuted. And he says in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, Since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. You're being troubled. You're being persecuted. God will take care of them. Verse 7, And to give you who are troubled, the people who are being persecuted, He will give rest. The word rest there is a noun, not a verb. He's not telling them to rest. He's saying God's going to give you rest. And so to, you, he, to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all who believe because our testimony among you was believed. He was received up in glory, and someday he will return from there to judge the world. And the question that comes down to you and me today is, are you ready? Are you ready? You see, right here is the great mystery. This is the core. This is the cornerstone of our faith right here. And the, the last phrase there, received up in glory, don't forget he's coming back now to judge the world in righteousness. You're going to stand before the Lord, like it or not. And you're going to give an account for your life. Have I been faithful? Have I believed in the Son of God? Have I accepted these truths? And God is going to make a determination that will determine where you spend all eternity. 
I'm not talking about 30 years. I'm not talking about 70 years. I'm talking about forever. Where's it going to be? Heaven or hell? With God or with the devil? In bliss or in punishment? The choice is yours. We're going to sing an invitation song. And if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to please think seriously about becoming a Christian. To think seriously about accepting the forgiveness that God offers. This is, this is a free gift. And if you'll just trust in Christ, He will wipe away everything you've ever done wrong. Every sin will be wiped clean. That is an amazing gift and it's an amazing offer. And, and I cannot understand how anybody would turn that down. So we extend that offer to you and we hope that you'll embrace it today. We hope that you'll become a child of God. To do that, you must believe that He's the Son of God. You must repent of your sins. You must confess your faith in Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you must be immersed in water. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. If you've already done those things, but somewhere along the way you've messed up, all hope is not lost. You can return to the Lord. Confess your sins to Him and He will forgive you. And we can pray with you as well. We can pray for you. We'd be delighted to do that. If you'll come right now while we stand and while we sing.